Start your day with It's the Business. Here's Bill Dobby. Well, today, 2020 was the year that the ad industry caught COVID. Some in the industry are still suffering from long COVID, but other parts of the industry rebounded quite well, like digital, obviously. What the last 12 months have shown is that digi- digital communications are really important and advertise the components of that. And that is why, despite the worst predictions in March, April 2020, by the end of the year, it wasn't as bad as many had feared. So Gideon Spanner joins me to talk about how the ad industry will recover, what's worked well, what the lockdown has taught us, and why brand is still key to advertising success. Plus, oil prices jump as one ship closes the Suez Canal. Well, the boldest bow of the ship is jammed into the side of the canal. So what we have to do is we have to dig that out. And that could take days. So we asked today, is the ship telling us something? And is the EU really about to ban the export of vaccines to the UK? Really? It may be appropriate to consider whether exports to this country are justified. It's definitely heating up from not trusting the vaccine to now being so keen on it they don't want to let it go. Quite a turnaround from Brussels. The fever for vaccines. That's all coming up today. It's Thursday the 25th of March 2021. Good morning. And now it's the business making sense of it all with Phil Dobby. Well, financial markets are so transient, aren't they? We had a a big leap in oil prices yesterday, largely because a very large container vessel, the Ever Given, has run aground. It's completely blocked the Suez Canal. I like the uh, the, the way the Daily Telegraph described it. They said a 200,000 tonne fishbone stuck in the windpipe of global commerce. And they do seem to be having trouble dislodging it. There's no Heinlich manoeuvre for shipping canals. So how do they get rid of it? Well, here's maritime consultant Dean McKelson talking to ABC News in Australia yesterday. The bow of the ship, the bulk, the boldest bow of the ship is jammed into the side of the canal. So what we have to do is we have to dig that out. Um, we can't do any dredging. So we'll slowly bring in more equipment to dig that out, probably about 50 metres on each side. So they've got the Baraka 1, which is a large tug, which they could probably help to pull that through. The Baraka one can pull 160,000 tons. The Ever Given um, basically is 220,000 tons. So they're comparable. So with a lot of pushing and shoving, they can probably wiggle it out. But the longest the canal has ever been stopped for is nine hours. And this has gone over now over a day. So I probably anticipate about two days. Well, it could actually be uh, a lot more than that. But what he's describing is pretty much what they're doing. A few blokes and a tractor are digging away the edges whilst a few tugboats are trying to pull it out at high tide. But to no avail, uh, there was some hope last night that maybe high tide had uh, had lifted it, but it's still there. There's now 150 vessels waiting to get through, uh, and uh, the, the dredges are on the way. Uh, if, if this doesn't work, if they can't dredge their way out of it, which is looking doubtful, then they're going to have to start offloading some of the containers. Imagine how long that's going to take. And they have to get it moving because 12% of global trade, 12% of everything that is moved around on this planet passes through the Suez Canal. That's 50 vessels a day from Asia to Europe. It's a long way around otherwise, so uh, one ship is having a massive impact here. In fact, it added 6% to the price of oil in one day because of fears that it's also going to slow the supply of oil. So, of course, less supply pushes prices up, but uh, it's already going back down, even though the uh, the ship is still there. Investors are so fickle. In fact, oil is generally falling at the moment because everyone is starting to realise that the COVID recovery might not be so fast after all, because, you know, except here in the UK, the vaccine rollout has been slower than anticipated. And we've got this whole vaccine nationalism going on now as well, which is going to slow things down potentially more. So uh, the fact that, you know, the recovery, economic recovery is going to take uh, longer means that demand for oil will probably be uh, slower. Uh, and therefore, we've seen oil generally heading down. This gave a little bit of a peak uh, yesterday. It's on its way back down again now. So they've forgotten about it, even though the vessel is still there. The problem in the Suez is vessels are getting bigger and bigger and they're they're doing that because it's cheaper to have much bigger vessels rather than lots of smaller ones because you can offload them faster than having multiple vessels Uh, but of course you know loaded with freight that 
adds to the weight, so this was bound to happen. This is actually the biggest vessel to pass through the canal. Nobody's exactly sure why it drifted, although there are reports that there was uh, storms and high winds in the area, and also reports that maybe it lost power, although that's being denied now. But there's a more fundamental question out, uh, behind all of this. Given word at a time, you know, now, coming out of COVID, when we can question anything, and we should really, shouldn't we? You know, what, what are we going to change on this planet? Because we know the other crisis which is coming is climate change. Well, it's not coming. It's already here. Climate change. Nine out of ten items we buy are shipped on container vessels. Nine out of ten. And these ships are massive polluters. So get this. One ship in a year produces as much pollution as 50 million cars 15 of these ships produce the same pollution as all the cars in the world and we have more than that number way more than that number passing through the Suez canal every day so does it make sense that we buy quite so much from china and have it shipped halfway around the world maybe this ship the ever given is a wake-up call for us it's the business making sense of it all with phil dobby a Royal Dutch Shell incidentally made a net loss of $21.5 billion last year. Numbers out overnight show that. Its uh, its revenue dropped by nearly 50%. So, uh, and so much depends, doesn't it, in the economy on the volatility of oil prices, like inflation, for example. It, wouldn't it be nice when we reach the stage where we are less dependent on it, you know, because we'll have a more stable economy? There is that. But also, there's that whole killing off the planet thing. There is that too, isn't there? Uh, now, on vaccines, there's this going on. Here's a con- country of destination which uh, has a large production capacity restricts its own uh, exports of vaccines or uh, substances uh, either by law or by other means uh, it may be appropriate to consider whether exports to this country are justified by this country he means us of course it's the story leading the front page of most newspapers today the possible eu blockade of vaccine exports to the uk The other bad news is that India is also stopping exports of the vaccine until they play catch up on their own soil. And they've got a long way to go. So maybe uh, we won't see much uh, coming from their direction either. Maybe we should have just kept quiet about how well we have been doing on all of this. Maybe we should have also been saying, oh, no, we, you know, we're, we're way behind here, too. Uh, the other story, by the way, on the front page is to, uh, just to digress for a second. It's this idea that you might have to have the jab to go to the pub which effectively means we are raising the drinking age from 18 to 50. And, you know, and quite right, too. I mean, there'll be a much more dignified air about the place, won't there? Uh, The Telegraph has said that the Prime Minister will let landlords decide whether to demand drinkers prove they are vaccinated as Tory MPs protest. Actually, you know, you could add that to the end of any sentence, couldn't you, really? As Tory MPs protest. The weather today, showery rain in northern areas with sunny spells in the south as Tory MPs protest. Uh, In entertainment news, Bob Mortimer set to release autobiography about his near-death heart issues as Tory MPs protest. See what I mean? Works wherever you want to put it. But this idea that you must have the jab before you go to the pub as Tory MPs protest, uh, how will they know at the pub whether you've uh, actually had the jab or not? I mean, they'll, will you have to show a certificate? So presumably when you go to the bar, you just, you know, someone else is going to get it. I mean, you'll have to give your certificate to other people. Otherwise, you'll end up buying all the drinks. So you just give your certificate to whoever uh, is getting the drinks next. Unless we have some sort of indelible mark on our forehead so we can see instantly who's got it and who hasn't. Maybe that would be handy in society as we all walk around. We can see who's safe and who isn't. The other telltale sign, of course, that you've had the jab is you're getting on a bit. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, you can't get served if you look under 50 unless you've got a certificate. Maybe that's it. You know, you've got a 45 year old uh, getting an order in. Can I see some ID, please, sir? These are weird times, aren't they? Anyway, that's the main story on the front of the Times today, along with this new diktat, by the way. I digress again. The, uh, the the fact that the Union Jack must now fly on all government buildings. What, what is this madness? We've all become very patriotic all of a sudden, whether we want to or not. And apparently it is very woke. Uh, looking at the comments in the newspapers, people are agreeing with this. It's very woke to object 
Uh, I am part of the woke brigade for suggesting that this is all a bit of social engineering. But look, getting back to the vaccines, the Independent says the EU will lose out from vaccine ban, warns PM. This is after Boris Johnson said this in Parliament yesterday, without a flag in sight, incidentally. I would just um, uh, gently point out to anybody considering uh, a blockade or an interruption of of supply chains that uh, companies uh, may uh, look at such actions and, uh, and, and draw conclusions about uh, about whether or not it is sensible to make uh, to make future investments in uh, in countries where you know uh, arbitrary blockades are, are imposed. Yeah, he's right on this, isn't it? It's not looking good for the EU. But the I is saying today, Britain and the EU are in late talks to try and avoid a vaccine blockade. It says diplomats from both sides are trying to create a win-win situation that's going to secure the supply of these vaccine jabs. Uh, It says vaccine firms rattled by the new power of veto and they urge the bloc to back down or lose investment. Exactly what Boris Johnson has been saying. The FT is saying this morning that Britain has offered to help boost production of the AstraZeneca vaccine at the Halix plant in the Dutch city of Leiden and Downing Street's not ruled out the UK giving up some of the millions of doses it claims to have been contracted to it. But Matt Hancock, meanwhile, is saying that the contract for the UK and the EU is very different. They've got a best efforts contract. We have an exclusivity deal. But here's the worry. The European law that was uh, tabled yesterday, it's been drafted actually says that they would see exports banned to countries that are ahead of the EU in their vaccine rollout, even if the company that's supplying it has met its contractual obligation to the EU. In other words, irrespective of what the contract says, we would have to wait until the EU has caught up with us. And they've got a long way to go. And of course, it's you know it's not just supply, it's also demand. A lot of the French don't want to take it at all. Do we have to wait till they change their minds? That could take years or lifetimes. AstraZeneca has said it's going to deliver 30 million doses in Europe by the end of this month compared to the 120 million that was targeted in the contract. So this is why the EU is so upset about this. But a week or two ago, of course, they were all suspending the rollout because they were concerned about its efficacy. So now they want to play catch up. I mean, if they'd met their contractual obligations, then the EU rate of jabs would be 36 per 100 rather than where it currently is, which is less than 14 And we're on 46. So you can see why they are annoyed. But it's going to get ugly, isn't it? Now, yesterday, you remember, as you listened avidly to every word of the podcast, Tom Cheeseright went through behaviours that we have adopted during the COVID crisis that might stick with us long after the lockdown has gone. He, He was snooping through your Barclay card bills and looking at how spending behaviour has changed. You missed that one? Well, go back and have a listen to it. It's there forever. Uh, Well, the ONS has been looking at this too, uh, and I came across these numbers yesterday, asking people which activities they think they keep doing more of after the end of the coronavirus compared to what they were doing before, in those glory years when we could do what we wanted. Uh, Only 20% actually said that they'll work from home more, 20% although it does rise to 38% for those aged 30 to 49, but falls to 17% for the over 50s. Maybe that's because, you know, a chunk of the over 50s are already working from home. But 20% overall is the uh, the increase in number of people who are going to increase the amount of time that they're working from home. 35% of us will do more online shopping, but only 19% will do more online grocery shopping, which I found surprising. But there again, I guess a 20% increase, if you think about it, in online grocery shopping is a quantum shift. 40% of us will avoid crowded places. More than half of those over 50 say that that's what they're going to be doing. Well, thank goodness there's not going to be crowded pubs because only the over 50s will be allowed in. And 30% of the over 50s say that they're going to avoid using public transport more. A third of us will also be doing more video calls with family or friends. And just 15% of us say we will continue to order more takeaway food. And almost a quarter uh, say none of those things. Life will presumably just go back to the way it was before. Although that figure is 
heavily skewed to the over 70s. The over 70s, they are going to continue doing what they were doing before, which is sitting in their nice chair all day at home watching Pointless. That's not going to change. Uh, Which brings us to our main topic of the day today, the future of the advertising industry. I'm not quite sure how, because you can't advertise on Pointless because it's on the BBC, uh, unless you're watching reruns maybe on uh, one of the other multitude of channels. But the advertising industry, like most industries, of course, suffered heavy losses in revenue last year. I'm not sure of the exact figures maybe our guests will have something more reliable than this but i've seen anything from four and a half percent up to 15 percent but the expectation is whatever it was it's going to jump back big time this year maybe as much as 13 percent increase in revenue so the industry will come out of this whole thing perhaps a little ahead of where it went in well gideon spania is editor-in-chief of the ad industry magazine campaign so does that seem likely to you that we will see this big bounce back in advertising this year? Well, we really ought to because uh, I'm talking to you pretty much on the anniversary of when the UK went into the mandatory lockdown. So that was on the 23rd of March last year. And uh, as in many countries, most retail shut completely travel so the the declines this time last year in advertising spend were just horrific in mm. some areas they were over 50 percent down and in some for cinema for example where cinemas were closed obviously the revenue went down 100 percent. so it's definitely going to be some kind of bounce back this year in 2021 i think the interesting thing is what did we learn about the pandemic? Well, we learned that we can work remotely. Uh, it, that is, if you're not in areas like hospitality and travel, you can communicate. In fact, more than you can communicate, you must communicate. For many companies, digital communications were absolutely essential. And if you think about what how we spent our time, whether it was streaming and watching um, films and TV, whether it was communicating through Zoom and video calls, actually... What the last 12 months have shown is that digital communications are really important Mm. and advertising is a component of that. And that is why, despite the worst predictions in March, April 2020, by the end of the year, it wasn't as bad as many had feared. Yeah, except for those industries that you talked about, some of which, you know, are going to take a while to, like the the cinema industry, is going to take a while to get back up to speed, isn't it? So does that mean we are going to see, I mean, obviously there has been this long trend towards digital has this just expedited that and there's no going back from it well i definitely think there's been an acceleration in some digital habits and people of all different ages and i give an example of my parents-in-law had never done online grocery before Mm. but they needed to because they were shielding and you've seen a lot of Uh, subscription-based services. I'm thinking of things like Netflix and Disney Plus go up because we were at home. And also, generally, e-commerce really took off. And if uh, Amazon, for example, their revenues were up 50% in the UK. And if you think of online shopping as really a digital shop window and you can go from discovery to actually purchase in a couple of clicks. That is really, the advertising is playing an important role there in the prominence of certain products. You can advertise on Amazon to make your product more visible. And of course it leads to results. If you can mm. advertise and it leads to results and you're gonna advertise more. So the short answer is I think, yes, did some aspects of digital consumption are going to increase. There will be a swing back to -to face-to-face because people have missed that so much. Uh, My general rule about when it comes to advertisers is advertisers follow audiences. So if the audiences are spending more time online in some parts of their life, for example, shopping, that's where they'll be, but they'll also want these uh, experiences, whether it's uh, um, shopping, yeah. meeting people, eating festivals. They can't follow them to some places where we are spending a lot of time, though, like Netflix now, rather than watching uh, you know, traditional TV. We are going to these subscription services where there is no advertising. We're spending hours watching Netflix that we perhaps would have spent watching commercial TV. So um, that's got to have an impact on the industry, hasn't it? Yes, it's really, really interesting. And I don't think that it's clear how things will play out. So subscription is great for those who can afford it. And it it, it means that you are paying the content creator or the content platform. But a lot of people can't afford it. And 
uh, also advertising uh, does it is a brilliant way to fund content. It's just a case of balance, I suppose. So will we get that balance here? Because they do in the States, don't they? There are over-the-top TV services which are funded by advertising. We haven't seen that happening here yet. I wonder whether that's a, a an opportunity that advertisers will be able to take advantage of sometime soon here. Yes, I mean, they, they, so I'm going to posit uh, a couple of uh, points for you. So one, the high-quality content of it, whether it's journalism, whether it's films, those kinds of pieces, those that kind of content requires investment and the, the advertising alone, it's difficult to fund that. However, mm. there are a lot of people for whatever reason will want not to pay. So Spotify has something like twice as many people who get the ad funded free version of Spotify as they do from their paying subscribers. But the point is, is uh, I'm just using these figures approximately. If 60 million people subscribe to Spotify and they pay quite a lot of money, they still got another 120 million who are, they're less valuable to them, but they're still worth something because they get about 10% of their mm. revenue from advertising. And to flip it on, what about an advertiser? How do you reach this audience if they're in places which people call them non-commercial? There's because there's no adverts on, say, yeah. Netflix. It's really and, that, and, that, and that, that's sort of my point. How do you reach them? Because we've got all this time that we've been spending at home, but actually we've been spending a lot of it away in, in areas where advertisers haven't been able to get to us. Advertisers will always seek out audiences. I'll give you one good example the gaming so uh, computer games mobile games have mm. uh, exploded and they as they appeal to bigger and wider audiences not just young men but to uh, older people women the the gaming industry is getting open to the idea of working with brands now how because a brand might advertise within a game and it needs to be authentic and embedded there are ways that advertisers go and reach people. And, you know, if you think about social media, why have Google and Facebook uh, and other platforms like now TikTok and Snapchat attracted so much advertising? Because people are spending time there. And so far, no one has been willing or virtually no one has been willing to pay for these social platforms. And yet the numbers show that people are spending lots of time there. So actually, we are exposed to more advertising than ever. The, a bigger philosophical question is actually, don't advertisers need to think more carefully about how much they bombard audiences on places like social media platforms? Mm. And that's a real challenge is just because you can doesn't mean you should. Well, when you've got all of this diversified media that you're talking about, you know, so we've got social media, we've got games, as you're saying, and then, uh, you know, we've got, still got all the traditional media as well. When you've got such a, a variety of media, how can you be sure that you are actually reaching the right person across the various platforms that they're going to be using? How do you keep track of them and be able to say, well, we have reached that person several times now uh, throughout the day, and so we're getting that repetition of message, we're getting that brand reinforcement? Because well, when I worked in advertising again, many years ago, it was very straightforward. You advertised in newspapers, magazines, uh, a bit of outdoor, and uh, stuck some ads on the radio and TV, and that was it. And it was fairly easy to develop campaigns that would sit across, and you'd assume that you're going to reach the same audience several times through different media. How do you do that now, where you want to reach the frequency uh, for, for a message and you've got to do it across such a diversified media choice? How can you tell it's the same person playing a game who's driving past an outdoor poster who uh, watches the uh, the evening news on ITV? It's very complicated, isn't it? It's very complicated. You're exactly right. And it's it's a challenge in so many ways. It's It's hard to navigate the media space. However... The, the, I mean, the, the answer partly is to have a strong brand. And that means the yeah. advertising over time consistently. If you think of some, about some of the strongest brands and whether they're old brands or new brands. So I'll give you an example. Amazon. Amazon spent $11 billion on advertising. This is, okay, it is the biggest online retailer in the West. But the brands understand that being top of mind and being visible wherever that is and that could be in uh, sponsoring sport it could be sort of advertising on television it, it, out of home is very important in, in big shopping centers and next to uh, big streets there's there's many ways to get your brand visible and it, you know i think this the strongest brands 
tend to win. And it's, it's, I think you find time and time again that, that companies that invest in their brand, so long as their products match the brand promise, uh, you know, they, they, they are the ones that, that tend to win out. Right. So you can suck it in C in terms of media choice and try and fine tune it. But at the top of it all, if you've got the messages wrong at the beginning and you haven't got the, the brand message that, that is going to uh, gel with your audience, then they, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You're going to lose out. It's basically what you're saying. But, uh, and, uh, and advertisers doing that as well as they used to. Because we used to, I mean, you, you referred to it before, you know, about the quality of ads. We used to hang out. Actually, you know, sometimes the best programs on TV were actually the ad breaks. Some stuff, you know, we used to watch the ads. These are better than the TV shows. Is that still the case? I mean, are we, are we are we still producing brands as well as we used to, say, ten or twenty years ago? Maybe it's I'm getting older, and maybe they're not pitched at me. But I sense that that's not the case. I'm not enjoying being advertised at as much as I used to. Well, you're raising loads of interesting questions. I'm going to sort of try and frame it a slightly different way. This, as you say, there's loads of media choice now, far far more than perhaps even ten years ago, and along with more choice you know that there's uh, overall i think the quality has gone up actually so one ad i like from last year is with snoop dogg and it's for just eat and that if you've seen that ad it's that's good fun and it came out i think at the right time because it was all about ordering food at home and uh, it, it, yeah. it was made before the pandemic but it was very memorable and did somebody say just eat that's, that's, that's um yeah which which you know and the, 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 that jingle sticks with me as well so you know it's i mean yeah. absolutely all those old tricks of advertising are, are still around and, and clearly still very yeah. much in our mind but i think it, it so you're touching on a really really interesting area and it, it, it's what i if i try and link it back to what i was saying earlier what the internet has done is it's created a shop window where you can discover and buy in it in an instant in fact it's called last click attribution that idea that oh mm. look, you click there and you bought and bingo i'm going to do more advertising at that point but of course you know you, the, the brand awareness to reach that point that you're ready to buy yeah what about all the stuff that happens um before that moment you've in got the, to make people want moment. to click Absolutely, you've got yeah. to get them there, and, and they've got to want to. Click. And 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 I think that the thing that, that, that again that comes back to brand investment. Mm. Um, and there are many examples. Uh, you know, what, one of which is the sort of uh, uh, the sixty-year-old man who bought the Aston Martin because he got exposed to the ad when he was twenty, and and that's a forty-year investment to the point where he could afford <laughs> the Aston Martin. I know that's a sort of extreme example, but it, it, brand investment as opposed to just what people describe as performance uh type marketing where it's all about directly linked to a performance a sale in that moment it's a big debate that's going on in advertising because google facebook amazon they're very effective places because things can sort of happen in the moment you can click to buy straight away but, but there's, actually, there's more jingles and things um you know memorable characters and adverts why is there a meerkat for the price comparison site compare the meerkat it, it, because they they created mm. that as an idea and it's stuck and it's stuck for more than because 10 years it, yeah because it stands out but that was 10 years ago as you say so where is the is the big brand building happening now because of course you know a lot of it happens on tv but as we've said we're you know we might be stuck at home but we are watching less tv and what tv we are watching we're not getting exposed to as many ads so where are all the big brands being made these days? Well, I'm going to say the big brand building is actually companies are building brands all the time. And uh, just to sort of invert the whole thing, what what's happening is it's never been easier to build a business from scratch. And if you think about some of the companies we've been talking about uh, and, and others too, but like Just Eat, Uber, currently floating on the UK stock market, Deliveroo, Moonpig, which is uh, the greeting online greeting cards company. Uh, there's so many companies that, um, Ocado, that have, have, have sprung up in the last five to 20 years, all because of the internet. So it's faster than ever to build a brand. And because they're digital brands, they build them through online exposure. And social media has been an amazing place to get uh, a sort of uh, a genuine fan base when when you have a, a popular brand and it's a, a great place to sell because people can um, uh, literally click and buy. So uh, it, where is the brand building going on? 
I mean, it is going on in in multiple ways, but I I think that still TV is important, and uh, places like cinema out of home. I mean, there is a lot of advertising because actually there are more opportunities to reach people. I think the big brand architecture, the big kind of you know, I know what this brand stands for. That kind of work is going on all the time, and it and it can happen in in you know. I'll give you an example. You go into an Apple store. I mean, you that is part of the brand. And things like design and the customer experience is all part of what it takes yeah, to build it's the, the brand. Cohesion, isn't it? So, actually, across uh, all customer it, touch it is, points. It is, yeah. and, fact, that, yeah. and it, because there are more touch points now, it's in a way getting your big brand uh, sort of concept is is so important because then you know once you've got that, then lots of things can happen. Uh, it's sort of below that in one place or another. Um, you know, you want to reach uh, my daughter, you've got to go on TikTok. I'm not on TikTok. Just <laughs> right. We just got our daughter off TikTok, by the way. Uh, that took a, that, that was a lot of hard work, I can tell you. So, uh, right, rightly or wrongly. So, just final question then. I mean, uh, I'm sensing, and it, we may be disappointed in this, but, you know, the, there is this hope, isn't there, that the second half of this year, it's just going to be fantastic. You know, we will have had our jabs. We're back at the pub. The sun's shining. The days are long. Let's forget about winter. It's a long way off. Uh, you know, we are going to be jubilant in this country uh, and uh, more so than many other places where they haven't got quite the same rate of vaccinations. So do you think the ad industry is going to uh, uh, take the most of that big bounce back? Are we going to see a big bounce back happening in advertising as well? Is that attitude going to be reflected in 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 the campaigns that we see? I mean, it seems like this might be a, a huge opportunity for advertisers coming up. It is a big opportunity in a way, but I think uh, everyone is mindful of the fact that you don't want to get the tone mm. wrong. And there, if you remember right at the start of lockdown, there were a lot of uh, companies all sort of making homemade type ads, which were being shot on mobile phones saying, essentially, uh, we, you know, we're, we're here for you at this time. And, and actually it, it pr- prompted a bit of a backlash because they, they, everyone was saying the same thing and it didn't actually mean a great deal. The, so going forwards, yes, I think there will be a lot, a lot of optimism. Um, and my my caution would be, you know, we, we've known, we've seen with COVID that you have to expect the unexpected, sadly. But I do think overall there is a lot of positivity, and it's there's going to be um, a lot of there's going to be a lot of consumption. Uh, I mean, that's that, that's the truth, and advertising drives consumption. So I think the two will go hand in hand a bit. But just as a final thing. Uh, I think what the pandemic has done is it's heightened people's awareness around things like Black Lives Matter, uh, about environmental sustainability, gender equality. And these things are very important going forward because I think what where advertising is going to go is it's there's going to be more uh, sort of focus on, on holding companies to account on their brand promise. So if you promise something make sure your actions align and that's i think a big theme for the future um a great point to leave it on good to talk gideon thanks for bringing us up to date on all of that thanks and that is just about it for today there are reports incidentally before we go on twitter that maybe that cargo ship is on the move in the suez canal but irrespective the same question remains doesn't it whether actually big ships polluting the world as we rely so much on cons- uh, on shipping to give us what we consume, traveling such great distances. Is that really where we want to be? Uh, and the answer, obviously, is no to that. The other big news uh, is that North Korea has launched two uh, short-range missiles. Well, actually, not that short-range. They flew 450 kilometers. They reached an altitude of 60 kilometers. You've got to wonder about the timing of this, because Joe Biden is giving his first press conference today. It's taken him a while, uh, and he's expected to be addressing geopolitics. He's going to be setting out the U.S. relationship with North Korea, along with China and the EU uh, and North Korea. Obviously, he wanted to steal the headlines beforehand. Look, tomorrow Tomorrow, we're going to look at the idea from Andy Haldane uh, from the Bank of England that the UK economy is going to recover like a coiled spring. Uh, We've spoken about that numerous times on this podcast uh, because we are going to apparently spend up big with all that money that we've saved over the last year. Well, is that the case? I'll ask finance expert Rachel Springle uh, on the podcast tomorrow. And if we're not going to spend it, what are we going to do with it? Well, save it, obviously. Uh, Till then, enjoy your Thursday. See you in the morning. It's the business with Phil Dobby. Listen online at it's the dot business or wherever good podcasts.